All good? Okay. So, um, my name is Marty. That's Michael. We're from the Lenar Technologies Division. And uh, we're going to be talking about some Zephyr related work that we've been doing. Um, before I do, I guess I should say that uh, I think one of the things that we think about what we do with NLTD is that we try to create easy buttons for Zephyr. You know, we take a lot of the upstream work and we think about um, what additional infrastructure might be needed to make it easy to deploy in a more end to end scenario. Um, and this is a really fun thing to do when you're working with a project that's moving as quickly as Zephyr. So I collected some development statistics this morning. Um, the kind of the biggest one was 1.6, I think, when the the unikernel was defined. But you can tell, even though it's slowed down since then, it's still like four times more change sets um, than in February. So this is going a lot more quickly than it used to. Um, at Last Connect, David gave uh, his first talk about MCU boot, which he already talked about. So I won't belabor the point. And we did a demo, a keynote demo, showing how we could do uh, device update through the Hawkbit update server. Um, and since then, there was another keynote update this morning, which you may have seen, uh, where we showed uh, the LWM sub, LWMTM subsystem. And um, I want to talk a little bit about, we, saw, we also showed some Bluetooth mesh lights. Um, and Michael will talk about those. But before then, I want to talk a little bit about uh, photo framework, which is an idea that I've kind of got bouncing around in my head uh, for Zephyr and that I've been doing work with with a couple of other people in different companies and groups. Um, cool. So this is my, these are my desiderata, my personal desiderata, and I want to present them to you as the other Zephyr people that uh, are here so that we can talk about them. I, the short version is that there should be an easy button. Um, it should be able to add support for MCU boot for either a new SOC or even if there's already SOC support within Zephyr to a new board without having to go and get your pull request approved in mainline MCU boot and having the overhead of two review processes to deal with. Uh, furthermore, it should be possible to share system configuration related to the bootloader between the application and the bootloader itself. Uh, one of the things that David talked about earlier was that MCU boot's job does not include getting the update. So this means that the application has to know the exact same information about the flash layout that MCU boot does. And it has to know the same things that the bootloader does in order to you know, safely write the update. Um, and while we're definitely way better than we used to be, I think that there's a little bit of extra last mile work to do that um, I'd like to talk about that I think will get us into a really great place um, to start proceeding iteratively, iteratively from there. OK. So this is a quick picture um, of life under MCU boot. It lives at the, it's kind of a sort of ARM Cortex ME picture, and of course it's going to be different on Intel, which uh, MCU boot has been ported to. But MCU boot application image lives at the beginning of Flash. Uh, its vector table is kind of the reset vector table. Um, and then you've got a couple of application images. One is the main one, and one is the update one. And as David said, MCU boot will either swap them out using this temporary partition uh, labeled TMP, or just with a simple overwrite. In addition, there's uh, a little bit of an area where there's an MCU boot header at the beginning of the application image, and so the application's vector table and the rest of its uh, code are a little bit offset. Um, furthermore, this should not be assumed to take over the entire device. You can have gaps in between, uh, which, which I've shown in orange, where neither the, well, the bootloader shouldn't touch it at all, and the application should be able to um, play with it nicely. So that's kind of the, the quick picture. Um, and then the other thing is that, yeah, we've got sectors. So these areas are actually made out of sectors, of course. And sectors may have varying sizes depending on the SOC. Uh, and we might have, you know, weird things where I've seen SOCs where it gets bigger and then it gets smaller again and then it gets bigger again. Um, so this is something that you need to, to deal with um, in general when you're dealing with MCU boot and trying to make it portable and trying to make it easy. Uh, so that's one important thing that you need to think about. Uh, another one is the write block size. So, you know, you can typically read at byte granularity. You can erase, of course, only at sector granularity. But there's various granularities for how, you, how much data you need to write to flash in one go. And MCU boot needs to know this. And the applications that use it also need to know this. So right now, I think the big support issue that we've got on MCU boot, and I've got some patches up uh, both uh, for Zephyr and for MCU boot that are attempting to address this is that we still have like one header file per, for, per Zephyr board 
that contains a lot of this information. The, um, the blue pictures up here, which tell you, you know, how big are the image areas, have moved to device tree, but a lot of this other stuff is still something that you have to take care of with a, a target-specific header, um, which I see as a problem, um, not only because it's a little bit tedious and error-prone and you end up repeating yourself a whole bunch, uh, but also because, you know, the application needs a copy of this. And so, you know, we've, we've done a couple of, of device update systems at this point with di different protocols, and we don't have a much better solution than copy it into each application which isn't great, and of course, it's not great either when you want to change it, right? Um, and so one, one very good reason why you might want to change your layout, for example, is that if you're under heavy development, you want that scratch partition to be big because it gets overwritten a bunch of times if it's very small during a swap, and you don't want to wear out your board. Whereas in production, you don't expect that many updates, so it's okay for it to be smaller so that your application can be bigger. And there's little trade-offs like this that make having a centralized place to put this information uh, a lot better for people that are gonna want to use this. Um, the other thing that I mentioned during one of my questions to David is that I think it's an issue that the, the Zephyr flashing scripts right now aren't necessarily very partition aware, and so it kind of makes it hard um, also for, for build systems that want to know how to flash and debug uh, in a convenient way that's portable. Say, if you were trying to build a giant CI lab that wanted to test the same application on a bunch of different boards made by a bunch of different SOC vendors um, to do this in a clean way and to add, make integration uh, simple for CI as well as for developers. Um, so this is kind of where I'd like to go with this, uh, where we've got a dividing line between Zephyr and MCU boot. And uh, a lot of this has already started to make it upstream, but I just sort of wanted to talk about it here today as, as to why I see it as important uh, for using MCU boot within Zephyr, where we move the partition and sector map as well as the write block size and any other information into the flash driver itself. Uh, it can grab the information out of DTS, which is nice. Um, and that makes the uh, MCU boot hardware abstraction layer perfectly generic. We don't need to change anything anymore. And I've, I've got this working on, on a series with three different SOCs with widely varying flash characteristics. Uh, the other thing that I see being important, which is starting to happen now, um, is kind of having an MCU boot or DFU image manager subsystem within Zephyr that can not only build upon the flash driver, but uh, also help you do things like some of these longer term goals that David was talking about for MCU boot, like being able to communicate information from the bootloader to Zephyr, maybe wanting to deal with uh, multiple incompatible versions of MCU boot in a, in a clean way within one Zephyr subsystem. So uh, while I do think that getting rid of that red ugly box that's still in MCU boot is kind of the minimum thing that we need, and uh, we can, we can do that, and I would love to talk about this further with uh, any interested Zephyr maintainers. Uh, I also see this, this DFU manager over here being a really important part of the story going forward. So that's it uh, for me, and I'll leave it to Michael to talk about LWM Tim. Thanks. All right. Go ahead. So my name is Michael Scott. I'm an embedded engineer with the Linaro Technologies Division. We're going to talk about lightweight machine to machine, or LWM to M today. Um, this is a recent addition with Zephyr 1.9. We um, had done some early on demos back in earlier versions with different varying combinations of TP TCP stacks. We wanted to look at something that was more constrained, something that was smaller, was able to run on smaller profile devices, less memory, less flash. Um, so let's talk about what LWM to M is. Just as a quick overview, um, LWM2M is based on the um, COAP protocols. COAP is a U2P, uh, it's the uh, U2P protocol. It has a very small packet header. It has no state to it. You fire and forget, you get a very quick ACK reply and there's nothing to it. Whereas TCP has sequences, has state machines, it has to follow, there's a lot of logic. When you get into that, you, you build a lot of code around that. And uh, to apply for constrained device, you really want to stay as small as possible. So. Um, with CoAP, you have kind of these resource-based um, queries that you make using get, put, and post. I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit. But um, LWM to M makes the same use of those get, put, and post methods, but correlates them um, into more of a read, write, create, delete type methods. And those are um, outlined in the uh, box there for LWM to M. Laying on top of that, 
we have these core set of uh, smart objects that the LWM10 system uses. These are security-based information. They're a set of well-defined resources that are well-documented. So rather than the co-op approach of you designing your resource name and sort of using them, these are um, actually put into the spec so that everybody knows what to expect, how to query them, what kind of response you're going to get back. And at the very top of that, you can design your applications to make queries against those well-known objects and get well-known responses back. So we're going to move on. So lwm the core spec is 18 different objects. It starts off with security and, and server information. There, uh, included in that is also some device information and firmware. It goes on into access control model and some other things. And later on, I'm going to get into which portions of the original spec are implemented with version 1.9 and what we can expect later. Um, moving past the original 18, which are managed by the OMA, uh, the working group, there is an IPSO smart object layer, which is comprised of probably hundreds of different definitions for objects. They all belong in a registry uh, that the Open Mobile Alliance has where you can define what the object is, what the resources are, what kind of uh, data element it follows, and whether it's optional, required, read-write, it's all very well documented. Um, one example of, say, an IPSO object is the light control object, which was done in our demo today, this morning, with the, uh, it was a wireless LED where you saw Tyler was sending a command, it would turn the light on, turn the light off. What he was doing was he was using a, um, a write method against the on property or the on resource of the light control. And so just to use that as an example, these, uh, for more information on a lot of the details for these different objects, you have to go to the OMA registry and it just goes on and on. This is an example of that light control object. So the object ID for that would be 3311, and that would be the first portion of what is the URI for how to read and write to that object. Each of these objects can have multiple instances in some cases. You could have a, a dual lamp style light where it has instance zero and instance one. So the URI would be comprised of 3311 slash the instance number zero or one slash and the resource ID that's shown above here. So we have on off, which is a read and write, and it's a single mandatory field that can be true or false. And that was what Tyler was using. We also have optional fields, such as the dimmer, which is an integer and actually even more detailed in the spec, it tells you it only accepts a range from zero to 100. But um, the spec is fairly detailed as how these objects are laid out and what, they, what you can expect. Um, I'm gonna burn through this pretty quickly. What I wanted to get into was more of a, you're here to learn about LWM to M, but also how it was implemented in Zephyr. And so one of the approaches that I took when we implemented it, um, the engine itself is fairly simple. It has a very basic state machine where it makes a connection to a server and then it updates it every so often. The problem with LWM to M is you see a lot of duplicated code in each one of these objects and they end up tending to just sprawl out and kind of add up over time because there are literally a lot of these objects. So one of the goals was to abstract the engine enough that you can just define the objects in a very simple way. So the object code is very small and that doesn't tend to add a whole lot of weight over time. So this is an example of that light object that I showed you earlier. So you can see how we have the on off dimmer on time. And then if you look at the data definition, this is actual code from Zephyr. You have the light on off field, it's a rewrite Boolean. Limer, you have the dimmer ID on time cumulative. And this is actually just the definition of the resource fields themselves. So the other half of this is later when you create the object, you actually get initialization of the resources themselves. And so those two parts basically combine the full object definition in Zephyr. And it's actually pretty simple once you get into it. There's not a whole lot of code to make a new object, which is where we need to go next. Um, so using Zephyr LWM to M in a sample is actually hopefully easy. We have a generic set of LWM to M engine setter getter methods. You use the actual resource URI there first, and you can set the value to whatever you'd like. And it depends on whether it's a string or say a U8. Um, obviously the only example I have up here is strings. 
But um, what I'm doing right here is I'm initializing a set of device values based on the manufacturer model number. And then when you're done initializing whichever objects you're using, you literally start the, um, it's a registration device client and it will start the state machine and continue from there. What's neat about this is um, as you select these objects, they register themselves with the engine. And so there's really like three levels of initialization that happens here. All of the objects are created, they register themselves with the engine, and then in your sample code, you set the default values, you set whether I'm creating instance zero, instance one, and then the client starts, and then remotely, whether or not you allow access to it, you can create more instances or delete them. Um, so it's kind of um, a little bit of separation there. So the last thing I wanna cover is how you can play with LWM10 today. And uh, if you're using real hardware, I highly recommend you look into what the Leonardo Tanaka Technologies Division is working on. This is um, a very easy to use build system where we've making more like an easy button um, to build and deploy. Because using this on an actual device is complicated. We're talking about maybe a BLE device where you need to talk to a gateway and that gateway has to talk to cloud services and it all gets very complex very, very quickly. So what we have here in the slide is a URL to our documentation. You can kind of read all about it. If you would rather just run it on a local machine, here's a very simple set of uh, instructions. You basically um, can download the latest version of the LaShawn demo server. You run it with a series of commands. You can check out the Zephyr sources. There's a pretty simple getting started guide. There, the interesting bit is you also have to follow the QMU networking setup because you're gonna run it locally, you don't have a real network. And literally it's one statement to open up the sample LWM to M client running in QMU that will then in turn connect to the LaShawn server and you'll see the UI pop up right away. And from there you can kind of do what uh, Tyler was doing during the demo where he had all of the resources. You can play with it, really good, a good feel for how the uh, protocol works. Um, so let's talk about what's in today. There's the basic LWM to M engine that I had talked about, which provides that level of abstraction so we don't reduplicate all this code for all the objects as we're creating them. The four basic objects, um, security server device firmware are in there. We uh, have a basic state machine for the registration system so that it will update itself with a registered server, as well as we support firmware update uh, in both a push directly against the resource and a pull when you supply a URI, it will pull that back. Coming in the future, there's a lot of work to do, um, and this is where the community can get involved. We, um, one of the big things is we're migrating to a new co-app API. It was talked about a little bit earlier during uh, Paul's talk. Um, network buffers are interesting in Zephyr. You don't get a contiguous buffer, but currently the LWM to M system does expect it. So the packet sizes are fairly large. You'll notice that the, the buffer definition is around 384 bytes, which is probably too large for most devices. Um, that's gonna change with the new co-op API migration. We'll have smaller buffers, but you'll have to read them in non-contiguous ways. But we're gonna take care of that hopefully soon. There's um, ongoing support to add DTLS for the LWM to M engine, as well as the bootstrapping portion of the registration client that uses that. Um, and then there's a lot of objects that, uh, that can be created now. So we were talking about actuators, we're talking about uh, location, access controls. Um, if you go out on the um, OMA registration, you can see that there's a ton of other things out there. It should be pretty easy to implement new objects going forward. And lastly, I just want to talk about optimization. You know, it's a lot of code to get up there in a very quick amount of time, so there's a lot of room to shrink these things. We use a lot of assumptions when you first put it out there. And I think the next round, we're really gonna to try to shrink the footprint of the um, LWM to M client so that it fits on a lot more devices. And with that, I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you for your time.